for the invitation, Brandon, and to all of you for being here uh, after Halloween. I think, was it a fun night here? Everybody had lots of decorations. Uh, um, so um, I'm a political scientist, and I'm going to do something intrepid, something daring. I'm going to talk about economics. I want to... How many of you here study political science and economics? So there's some. Or both? Okay, all right. Yeah. So I want to talk about the economic crisis in Venezuela, which it's very important that we hear it over and over and over again. It is one of the most catastrophic economic crises in the history of economic crisis. Perhaps not the worst, but you know, to be in the top five is to really uh, suggest a degree of economic destruction that we don't often see. Um, and it's all over the news. People uh, are talking about it, uh, even the United States government. And I want to give you an explanation for it. It's my version of the story. There are others. But since I was invited, why don't you hear my version of the story? Um, in many ways, the argument that I'm going to make is that everything that Professor Lopez Maya agree, uh, talked about in terms of the political regime is the cause of the crisis. Um, this argument that I'm going to develop is different from two alternative theories about the origins of the crisis. So, so keep the alternative theories in mind and, and be aware that what I'm arguing is to challenge those theories. The first one is that this is the result of oil dependence and oil shocks in general that this is something that happened to Venezuela because of its uh, petrostate condition. The second rival argument is that this is a crisis brought on by economic minorities, mostly capitalists and the private sector. I'm not going to argue that. I'm challenging that. And what I'm going to argue is that what we're seeing here is exactly what you should observe to see in situations where liberal democracy collapses and goes away. The theory behind this is uh, Amartya Sen. Uh, he's a famous Indian development economist who uh, made this argument. He, he studies poverty. He's from India. He knows poverty. And he was asked once, Professor Sen, if you have only two choices to deal with poverty, give them basic needs or give them the right to vote in a liberal democracy? Which one would you choose? He was unequivocally on the side of give them the vote. Give them the vote and the idea is give them liberal democracy because liberal democracy is the only mechanism that exists that maximizes information so that when things start to go badly, the system can be aware of it and generate alternatives to the situation. If you get rid of the liberal democracy, Amartya Sen told you, you get rid of the only mechanism that produces information to get you out of trouble. And he proved this argument by studying famines. He said, the history of the world is full of famines, moments during which there is economic starvation. But they tend to disappear not all the time, but they tend to disappear the moment a country becomes democratic, the moment it becomes liberal, a liberal democracy. They stop happening. And he says, this is not coincidental, this is causal. And the reason is, the moment that a country starts to have the signs of going into a famine, this information gets reported, people get mobilized, they get organized, and they can do something about it. But if you foreclose the political system, there's nothing to move Titanic into a different direction other than crashing into uh, the iceberg. So that's the argument I'm going to make. Uh, slide number one. Here we go. All right. Um, this is an index of democracy. It's one of the many indices. It, what you're seeing here is not that controversial. Most indices agree with this. It measures countries in terms of how liberal democ democratic they are, one means a perfect score, almost nobody gets it, zero is no trace whatsoever. And the first thing is notice how Venezuela had a remarkable, for global standards, remarkable uh, transition to democracy early on and stayed democratic right around the time that Hugo Chavez comes in 
And uh, this is a graphical way of explaining what Professor Lopez Maya was talking about. It's very rare to see a democracy at that high point drop that low. Um, two other contenders from Latin America are there, Bolivia and Ecuador. And they were never as democratic as, Brazil, as, excuse me, as Venezuela was. And they have seen erosions in their democracy, but not to the same degree. So Venezuela really takes the cake. Yeah, it's really a remarkable transformation. And uh, today, this is, uh, it's classified by a different organization as not free. This means uh, uh, a political autocracy. Here's Venezuela. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, um, this is a new scoring up until 2017. Freedom House wasn't scoring Venezuela as a full-fledged autocracy, but now they do. Uh, next, Brent. Yeah. All right. The Venezuelan government under Hugo Chavez introduced economic populism. In economic populism, the idea is that you implement policies regardless of the costs. You do not pay attention to the revenue side, so you produce deficits. It's a terrible way of running the economy when you're spending without checking revenues. If we go to the next slide, um, here is what happened to the price of oil under Chavez. Uh, this goes back to 1935. This is the price of oil. Chavez comes in right here, and right around 2003, more or less, we get the most amazing expansion in the price of oil in the history of oil prices. This is like the country that you want to be president of. You're an oil state in a massive boom without precedent. Next chart, please. Um, this is a way of quantifying how much Venezuela received from this oil boom. And as you can see, here's Venezuela. Compared to other countries in the world and other Latin American countries in uh, earlier periods, Venezuela in the 2000s with Hugo Chavez got an amazing amount of money. What did they do with the money? They wasted it. They spent it and spent it and spent it, but they actually did something more than just spending it. They went into deficits. Next slide, please. This is a way to capture the deficit. Um, here what I do is, you have a deficit in your government if your revenues are lower than your outlays, your expenses. So you will have a negative uh, result, so below zero. During this oil boom, Venezuela only had surpluses in 2006 and 2008. The rest of the time, Venezuela was spending beyond its means. And I'm comparing Venezuela to OPEC, which is the largest organization of oil, uh, uh, of petrostates. And the other oil, pet uh, other uh, petrostates, oil states, did not enter into this kind of populism. But this is Hugo Chavez. This was impossible to correct. Nobody really wanted it. It produced a huge boom. But it meant that when the price of oil finally dropped, the country was already basically kind of bankrupt. Chavez's version of populism was also lefty. This version of populism that I just talked about can happen on the right wing and left wing. Uh, but there's a leftist form of populism. And um, that means you go after the private sector. And Hugo Chavez went after the private sector as if we were living during the Cold War with communism. You see an expansion of the state and restrictions in the private sector. This happened in a short period of time, the bulk of it. Between 2007 and 2009, the Venezuelan state went into a nationalization stampede. Chavez appeared on television walking around the town saying, who owns this building? They would tell him, uh, we need to expropriate it. What about this one? Let's expropriate it. Let's do this, expropriate. The state was expanding, expanding, expanding. And it basically took over not just the oil company, which was already state owned, but the most important industries in the country, businesses. Very few of them survived. This, uh, next points. This is uh, approximately $23 billion worth of nationalizations and expropriations. I'm not going to talk about these numbers, but I just want you to get an idea that this is really crazy. This is uh, a form of China doesn't do this. Nobody does this anymore, but Venezuela did it. And it, with it, it destroyed the private sector and the state took over. Next, please. Now, 
I'm going to show you what has got to be the most dramatic graph that I can show you in economics, in political economy, <laughs> which is what this country, what this state did with oil. We know that in this regime, you need the oil money because you're spending a lot. And this is part of the way that Chavez also constructed his uh, public appeal. So you would think that your milk cow, you may want to take care of it because you depend so much of it. The oil company under Hugo Chavez went into a horrific crisis that was not evident at first because the price of oil was very high, so money was still coming in. But it's evident if you just look at the production. Um, the, the important um, line to look at is the oil supply, which is how much oil Venezuela produces, measured in terms of oil supply, thousands of barrels per day. So oil production went up significantly. These are reserves with the red line. And then right around 1999, you start to see a serious decline all the way to Chavez's death. Let me be explicitly sexist. This is a man-made crisis in the sense of human and males did it. Um, nobody, nobody, none of the petrostates that I have studied have something like this. It's inconceivable in a period of oil boom where the demand is growing exponentially in world markets for an oil company to decline its production. But this is happening. This is happening because it's not just incompetence, but it's because when Professor Lopez Maya was talking about the way that you appoint people to the state, you do it less on merit and more on your loyalty. The oil company was populated by loyalists at every level who had no idea of how to run a company, and they run it to the ground. So remember I said that oil is not the explanation, even though I'm talking about oil. The company that produces oil was already in terrible shape before the price of oil collapsed after uh, 2000, 2013. Um, most other petrostates experienced that economic shock, but only the Venezuelan state was so ill, so unable to cope with it as a result of these economic policies. Um, a huge deficit, the end of the private sector, and uh, an incredible mismanagement of the most important milk cow in the country. Next, please, Brandon. When this crisis came in, the government, when the oil dropped, made a fatal decision, a fatal for society. In a petrostate like Venezuela, during the boom years, the country produced very little else far less than other petrostates. It was a level of lack of diversification that we haven't seen a lot. And um, suddenly there's no money. The price of oil goes down. You have a huge deficit. You have a lot of debt. And your oil company is a mess. And your private sector is destroyed. What Maduro did is something that if we were studying any right-wing government, ne uh, leftist people would be like, this is savage neoliberalism, because it is. The few dollars that were coming in, the few dollars that were coming in, were being denied to private society and being transferred to loyalists. And we have the data to show it, and I want to show it to you. Uh, Brandon, please. OK, this is the data, all right? So this is. Dollars coming into the Venezuelan state in 2011 versus, we have data for 2015, but it shows the adjustment. The adjustment is, what are we going to do with these dollars that are uh, increasingly scarce? Notice the, the drop in the inflow of dollars from 82 to about um, 41.2, uh, I think these are billions. Here's the outflow in 2011. You can see the deficit happening. You're spending more than it's coming in. 
and here's the uh, outflow in 2015. So clearly the government stopped spending significantly, but it was still spending far more than it had. So it continued to accumulate a deficit. And then we know where those dollars went. Very few went to private actors. Most of it went to the patrimonial state, the loyalists. This is really a very lopsided adjustment. By private sector, I mean the companies that import all sorts of um, uh, uh, economic products in order to work and produce, but it also includes consumer goods, consumer goods like medicine and food. This is what the Maduro administration has been doing since then. Very few dollars are coming in, and they are making the political decision of strangling civil society by denying access to dollars and denying access to imports. And the few dollars that are coming in are going to the group that is behind Nicolás Maduro. Uh, next slide, please, Brendan. All right, so let me just wrap things up, and then we can talk about it. Democracies liberal democracies go through economic crisis almost more frequently than we want to. But democracies have a built-in mechanism for <coughs> correction. It doesn't always work. Sometimes the correction doesn't emerge or the solution that is being provided is not the right solution. But there is no other regime in the world that has an explicit mechanism for an opposition to the state to get organized do a campaign and defeat the current team and replace it with another one. This became impossible to do in Venezuela as it transitioned away from liberal democracy. And it made it harder and harder and harder for the opposition to get organized, for the opposition to be able to uh, uh, transmit its messages. And when they finally got their act together, when the opposition finally managed to achieve a major victory, in 2015, 2016, 15, 15. 15, in 2015, they took over the Congress for the first time. They were so large that they were able to overcome all the obstacles and still make it to the finish line. Maduro abolishes the Congress indirectly. So it's gone. He replaced it with a constituent assembly. So the last resort, the last uh, resort ended. Most of these errors could have been corrected. The policies to address them exist. They're not that mysterious. Plenty of people from the left and the right talked about, let's get out of this mess before it's too late. But none of these ideas were able to produce a change in administration. And this was done because every year, the opportunities for the opposition to get organized declined and declined and declined. So a democracy might have produced an economic crisis. We see economic crisis in democracies. And Latin America had the 1980s where many crises were taking place under democratic governments. But democracies are preferable not because they are foolproof, but because when there is a problem, the system can get organized and produce a change. So there is hunger in Venezuela. There is famine in Venezuela, I would say, because the, nobody is producing anything uh, in the rural sector. And if we claim that we didn't know where this was coming, what we're saying is we haven't read Amartya Sen's uh, argument about why making the vote and the opportunity to get organized politically, which you get in liberal democracy, and for the opposition to be able to be able to displace uh, a bad government was gone. You have here a state that expanded without accountability, and a private sector that disappeared by, in the hands of the state without the state having to pay any political costs for it. So that is my account of what we're seeing a real Amartya Sen famine produced by the collapse of liberal democracy. Thank you very much.
like what do you think um prevented um P- PDVSA b- from being used as a cash cow before the Chavez administration because there was it was producing enough oil and it was and it did at least have a functioning administration but before the Chavez administration but so that, and so there was a case for at least it, it being used as a major cash cow to support the agenda of the administ- of the government but why wasn't it used up until the Chavez administration good yes um what you had in uh, Venezuela, and it was never uh, an amazing company. There were always issues, and, and a lot of money always went to the executive branch. But you have an independent board that determined what the investments were going to be, create the priorities, uh, set objectives, and that board was not a ministry of the executive branch. It was independent folks who would determine this. Um, there were also rules on how dollars needed to be transferred and it to be done through the central bank, which was also independent. And finally, there were rules on how the government could spend the money. All these three rules um, were immediately violated by uh, Hugo Chavez. And so you have this situation where um, uh, a system where essentially the executive branch needed to compete with other actors about how to deal with oil changed into a system in which only the president decided uh, what to do. So it's a very, you may think it's minutia, but I'm here to tell you it's the answer. It's uh, when you generate um, internal checks and balances within a, a, a government company that is ideal and it can happen. It's, it's the, the reason why um, PDVSA at some point was better run and uh, presidents couldn't do whatever they wanted with it uh, fully. I wonder if you might elaborate a little bit on the comparison that you were going to make to Colombia. My sense is that uh, Colombia had some catastrophe similar to this um, a while back, and that uh, the students of Milton Friedman came in and established something more along the lines of a free market economy and saved Colombia from absolute abject poverty. So I, I could be totally wrong, but I wonder if you, if that's where you were going and if you could elaborate on your comparison, please. Thanks. Um, sure. Um, I was going to go and compare the two oil companies, how differently they were run. Um, the Colombian oil company was crashing. Absolutely right. Um, the economy, not never so much. Colombia, Colombia is an incredibly mysterious case in development because it has all the reasons for underperforming economically and it always performs okay. It didn't have a lost decade, but it has war and corruption and drug trade and illegality, but it stays macroeconomically fairly stable even when the rest of the region isn't. But the oil company at some point in Colombia did crash. And what Colombia did, it didn't privatize at all. It allowed private companies to come in and compete for projects. So it made the oil company compete with private companies for contracts from the state. And that created incentives in Ecopetrol to become uh, a, a, a remarkable new oil company. It also created independence of the board as well as independence of the regulatory agency. It has, it has an independent board and an independent regulatory agency that, again, is not uh, uh, res- uh, doesn't respond uniquely to the president. So it's a really amazing change in institutional framework that delivered amazing results. Today, Colombia, with a lot less oil than Venezuela, exports more oil to the United States than, than Venezuela. Uh, if, if it's not more, at least very close, with, with significantly less, in part because of this productivity revolution um, that, that uh, we see. It's very interesting to, to compare them side to side, so I appreciate the question.